Support for this episode of Trifles is brought to you by the Baker Street Journal, the leading publication of Sherlock Holmes scholarship since 1946. Find them online at bakerstreetirregulars.com. And by listeners like you, who choose to support us on Patreon for as little as a dollar a month. Find out more at patreon.com slash trifles. Welcome to Trifles, a weekly podcast about the Sherlock Holmes stories. It is, of course, a trifle, but there is nothing so important as trifles. Yes, the lodger was veiled, the face was yellow, and the valley was fearsome, but there are so many other details to pick apart in the stories. Pray, be precise as to details. You know the plots, but what about the minutiae? Have you ever stopped to wonder what kind of medical practice Dr. Watson actually ran? Or about the number of Holmes' monographs? Or how much the rent was at 221B Baker Street? You are very inquisitive, Mr. Holmes. It is my business to know what other people don't know. Scott Monty and Bert Wolder will have the answers to these questions and more in Trifles. The game's afoot. Episode 361, Bears. Hello and welcome to Trifles, the podcast where we talk about the details in the Sherlock Holmes stories. I'm Scott Monty. I'm Bert Wolder. And Bert, I hope you're ready to grin and bear it. Yes, yes. I, I'm sitting here with my ranger hat on, not starting forest fires and trying to find Boo Boo. I don't know what happened to him. Gosh, Yogi, I don't think the ranger is going to like this episode. <laughs> hey, Boo Boo, maybe he's at a picnic, eh? Uh-huh. <laughs> well, uh, for those who don't know that reference, uh, go look up Yogi Bear. That's That's all I can tell you. Uh, I, was there ever a Yogi Bear Sherlock Holmes reference? I would be surprised if there wasn't, but uh, I don't know. I'm sure there must have been some cartoon investigation that prompted Yogi to put on, <laughs> take his hat off and put on his normal hat, of course, the, the ones bears always wear, and put on his uh, deerstalker, but I don't know of one offhand. I don't know. Oh, I'm it, not an authority on the Hanna-Barbera I see. cartoon universe. Well, I see there is an old uh, album out there called This Here Is Your Life, Sherlock Holmes, parody from the voice of Yogi Bear. Here's Your your Life, Sherlock Holmes is a 1975 parody written and voiced by Dawes Butler. Dawes Butler, well, he's one of the greats. And the Dawes Butler Workshop, um, including Billy Simpson, Pat Paris, and Corey Burton. Corey Burton, incidentally, took over for a lot of the voices in the Disney parks, like Paul Fries and Paul Heinrich. Um, Paul but in, Heinrich or Hans Conrad? Oh, Paul Heinrich. No, I know what you mean. Yeah. Uh, in it, uh, in, in this uh, album, uh, Ralph Backwards, along with Dr. Watson, Dracula, Jack the Ripper, and even Mary Hartman, Mary Hartman, roast the famous consulting detective. I've never heard of this before. This is amazing. Well, you've just found it now. Uh, I don't know what to say. Only about because that. I looked for it, dear Watson. Um, <laughs> Precisely what you may expect to see when I look for it. <laughs> right. Yeah, it's available on Amazon. I, well, I'll throw a um, a link in there to the audio book in our show notes if folks are interested uh-huh. in checking it out. It's 59 minutes long. Um. Man, Dawes Butler, Douglas McEwen. It's available as an audio book. Yeah. Good grief. Well, you wouldn't expect to read a book by Dawes Butler, would you? Well, why not? You know, I mean, cartoon, <laughs> all sorts of people write books. Gahan Wilson, you know, wrote a couple of mystery stories that, you know, weren't, well, a little odd, but they weren't terrible. Yeah. Well, uh, before we completely... Uh, lose our sight of today's episode. Let's get to it, shall we? This is where we're talking about bears in the canon. Um, And if you could hear a bit of pitter-patter, of stalling in our introduction here, you are absolutely 
an astute listener because there are only four instances of bears being mentioned in the Sherlock Holmes stories. And there's a good reason for that. Why and is that? it's a reason we're going to explore with you here today. If you'd like the show notes for this episode, you can find them on SherlockHolmesPodcast.com. Sign up there for email updates as well as a link to our Patreon for our most dedicated listeners. Uh, we, as that is the people who uh, are part of our Patreon community, we offer the show ad-free and we do a drawing at the end of every month. And this is one of those episodes. It's the end of November. So at the end of this episode, we're going to do a drawing for uh, a back issue of the Baker Street Journal. It'll be some random member of our Patreon community. So check us out at patreon.com slash trifles or on any of those Patreon buttons on the trifles website. And of course, if you haven't already done so, rate and review the show on Apple Podcasts. It helps other people find this quirky and wonderful material. All right, Bert, bears. Um, I suppose it should be no surprise to most readers that two of the four bear mentions come in two stories that have uh, an American component to them. But why is that? Why aren't we finding more bears mentioned in jolly old England? Well, the native bear population in the Untied Kingdom uh, went extinct around the 11th century during the Middle Ages. Oh, dear. Uh, as humans, those pesky humans, even then, we were expanding our civilizations to accommodate more people. Although there weren't really all that many people around the British Isles in the 11th century. But still... They uh, had a great idea. They would. Uh, the problem was there were all these trees in the way, and so they cut down very large sections of forests as their towns and villages and settlements expanded, and that reduced the population, that reduced the number of habitats suitable for the European brown bear. Hmm. Well, and... Uh you know, as uh, with any kind of civilization, when people encroach on the habitat of animals, the animals will uh, want to scrounge around, see what they can uh, get from the sloppy humans. So uh, mm -hmm. bears would uh, look for, obviously, look for alternative sources of food as their habitats were dwindling. And uh, lo and behold, humans are amazing at producing trash. <laughs> have been for thousands of years. Anything that we do, there are uh, things that we cast aside, and that includes uh, comestibles, food. And um, <laughs> I, can, I can just imagine in 11th century England, uh, the bear coming up uh, looking for a picnic basket. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's the same old story, just a different time frame. And uh, when when bears came in such proximity to people, obviously you've got hunters who are there and would use them as um, trophies to show their hunting prowess. Hmm. So, um, well, well, you know, there was this, this whole thing about um, bears and society is interesting because you know it's just occurred to me. I mean, there was in in the Victorian era. You know, the association of people and animals, it was, it was sort of a big deal. I mean, mm. um, the animals, you know, represented exploration, but they also represented civilization's triumph over the wild of nature. And, mm. and so they often became metaphors for social behavior. And then the Victorians got up to odd things like <laughs> bear baiting. You know, you would... You would um, bear baiting? Yeah, oh. you know, and, and, and bull baiting. You know, you would tie uh, a post uh, in the ground towards the edge of a pit, and the bear would be chained to it either by the leg or by the neck. And then, sadly, I mean, I don't want to describe any more of this, but basically, um, they would introduce into the pit with the chained bear um, some snarling menaces, and, uh, you know, you would watch this, and this would be, of course, your fascinating entertainment to watch 
this this um, you know mighty bear being um, deeply troubled by these other creatures. Mm -hmm. You know, the Victorians got up to a lot of um, stuff like that. You know, we, they didn't have the sensibility we have towards animals, animal rights, right. animal right. freedoms, and so on. I, and I'm taking it that it did not end well for the bears in those situations. Well, I don't know that there was. Uh, uh, I, I don't know that there were multiple rounds, you know, and now introducing <laughs> the, the winner of last night's battle. Uh. I don't know. Um, you know, but this was just part of these blood sports that they got up to. Yeah. Um, you know, they did bull baiting and they did a variety of basically well, baiting animals with dogs was something that occurred to a certain swath of Victorian society. Goodness. Well, uh, it looks like that happened. Uh, in the 16th and 17th centuries. So, uh, and at the Bear Garden. Ah, interesting. I prefer the Beer Garden myself. But. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, Parliament didn't introduce, you know, an, an act somewhere. It was like around Dick, I mean, it was around the 1830s. They had a, a um, Cruelty to Animals Act, and um, that sort of forbade the fighting and the baiting, but even that wasn't an easy thing to A, introduce, or B, to get uh, uh, people to uh, adhere to, to follow. Yeah, well, and if you think about it, too, that's 600 years because the, uh, the bear had gone extinct in England in the 11th century. That's 600 years of importing bears for this purpose. So uh, that's just, that's astounding. Yeah. Um, well, and as you pointed out earlier, you know, when, when we were t looking on about all this, Henry the Third in, in the 13th century was given a magnificent white bear by the King of Norway, theoretically, you know, a polar bear, and um, you know, these mm. sorts of things were. I imagine Victoria herself. Not that I know of this, but but must have. Um, I know she was given exotic animals during the course of her long reign. Be surprised if there wasn't somewhere along the line <laughs> a bear brought to Balmoral. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Go, good news, Your Majesty. <laughs> oh boy. Remember that equerry we didn't like? Well, funnily <laughs> enough, <laughs> yeah. when we open the crate, that's no longer troubling us. Well, uh, if we want to find a, a land of wilderness, uh, it, it takes us no further than the very first Sherlock Holmes story, A Study in Scarlet. And from a, uh, an excerpt there, uh, this is looking back at the, you know, the American section of A Study in Scarlet. Uh, the excerpt goes, There are no inhabitants of this land of despair. A band of Pawnees or Blackfeet may occasionally traverse it in order to reach other hunting grounds, but the hardiest of the Braves are glad to lose sight of those awesome plains and to find themselves once more upon their prairies. The coyote skulks among the scrub, the buzzard flaps heavily through the air, and the clumsy grizzly bear lumbers through the dark ravines and picks up such sustenance as it can amongst the rocks. These are the soul dwellers in the wilderness. Isn't that great? You know, we frequently question these American sections in some of the Sherlock Holmes stories, like Study in Scarlet and Valley of Fear. But here is, here is Conan Doyle writing this scene at a time when he'd never been to America and his only insight into that landscape and those actions and that climate and those animals was things he read as a child, like the mm. novels of Maine Reed, of Captain Maine Reed. You know, so he's, the, all of these things have been imprinted on him, and there they are on the page. Yeah, really remarkable scene setting in just one paragraph. Hmm. Bears lumbering through the dark ravines. Well, and then we get to Valley of Fear, and of course this is one of a couple of similar references like this, where, you know, the bear is brought to bear in the descriptions to indicate, you know, savage feelings, great emotion, wounds. And so what happens here is we, get, we have a great reveal that the Pinkerton man is actually amidst the gang. And as the police set in the, uh, at the site 
of their rifles, Boss McGinty gave the roar of a wounded bear and plunged for the half-open door, which he never gets through. Hmm. Yeah, the old wounded bear routine. <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, well, for anyone who hasn't heard a wounded bear, you know, one can conjure it up in your uh, in your mind, knowing that you know someone who has gone to this great length to avoid capture for so many years and has finally uh, he's finally uh, outdone. Uh, by the Pinkerton gang, um, you know it must have been something horribly heartrending for him, and you can imagine what a bear, a wounded bear, might have sounded like. Mm. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you what. Why don't we take a quick break here, and then when we come back, we'll get the other two references and dive a little bit deeper into bear decor. Stay with us. We're now in the fourth quarter of the year, and the Baker Street Journal is going as strong as ever under editor Dan Andriaco. We've just seen the cover for the autumn issue, and ooh, it is a doozy. Full-color rendering of Professor Moriarty's head and shoulders from Sidney Paget's famous illustration. Now, that's not to say the professor had dandruff, far from it with his bald pate, but we see the details of Paget's genius close up. And that's what the Baker Street Journal allows us to do with all kinds of scholarship and creative writing, to focus on the details of some aspect or another of Sherlock Holmes and his world, just like we do here on Trifles. If you haven't gotten a subscription for 2023, it's not too late. You can still subscribe, get all of the issues to date, and be signed up for the Christmas Annual. Just go to BakerStreetIrregulars.com and subscribe to the BSJ today. Okay, we're back talking about bears in the can. You know, I'm I'm always reminded of a scene from the Muppet movie from 19 was it 1978? <laughs> that movie came out when they're driving along and Fozzie Bear's Studebaker and they come to a fork in the road and Kermit's reading the map and they're singing moving right along. And Kermit says, bear left. And Fozzie says, right, frog. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Oh, I love that. That's great. <laughs> That's a great. That was a great picture. Yes, indeed. So um, where else do we find some bears? Well, there's another one of these references similar to the McGinty reference in the Red Circle when we're learning the backstory, what went on with these people um, and these, these awful crimes. And the explanation that we're getting, you know, is in this narrative about, about black Giorgiano. Giorgiano came to us, she says, as he constantly did in the evening, and he spoke much to me. And one night his secret came out. I'd awakened love within him, the love of a brute, he pushed his way in, he seized me in his mighty arms, hugged me in his bear's embrace, covered me with kisses, and implored me to come away with him. We made a <laughs> deadly enemy that night. What a great trivia question that would make for some Sherlock Holmes quiz. Who gave the only bear hug in the canon? That's oh boy, really something. That is a great trivia question, yeah. 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 Well, we can uh, we can chalk that up to uh, to uh, trifles non-listeners to uh, <laughs> be stymied. I bet, by that. I bet people would think that that's a lot was, of people. Uh, yeah, I bet people. <laughs> <laughs> I bet people would think that that was. Um, um, well, no, I was going to say Jeffrey Rucastle, but no, it's not yeah. Rucastle. Well, or uh, Grimsby Roylott with yeah, the Roy uh, over the parapet, you know, the the uh, blacksmith yeah. over the he parapet. Was always doing things like that. Yeah. Well, the uh, the final reference, and this is going to bring us into a little more detail, um, comes with probably what I think is the best opening scene in any of the short stories. It's the Priory School. And Watson tells us, we've had some dramatic entrances and exits 
upon our small stage at Baker Street, but I cannot recollect anything more sudden and startling than the first appearance of Thornycroft Huxtable, M.A., Ph.D., etc. Uh, his card seemed too small to carry the weight of his academic distinctions, preceded him, and then he entered himself so large, so pompous, and so dignified was he, the very embodiment of uh, self-possession and solidity. And yet, and yet, his first action when the door had closed behind him was to stagger against the table, whence he slipped down upon the floor, and there was that majestic figure prostrate and insensible upon our bearskin hearthrug. Hmm. A bearskin hearthrug. I don't think we had heard about a hearthrug, let alone a bearskin hearthrug at 221B Baker Street until this very moment. Oh, you're probably right. I had always thought that it was apocryphal until hmm. I you know, eventually encountered, I was corrected, I suppose, by reference to this passage. But I, I, in my own mental construction of the sitting room at Baker Street, I never mentally equipped it with a bearskin rug. But yep, there it is. Yeah. Well, uh, what do we know of hearth rugs? Um, you know, what what are they for? I, I don't know if everyone is necessarily as familiar with hearth rugs as they might otherwise be. Now that we are beyond the age of the coal scuttle and the uh, you know non centralized heating that a fireplace would afford people. Well, for those people who even today have wood burning fireplaces in their homes, I imagine they have some sort of hearth rug. Basically, the giveaway is the word hearth. When you're setting fire to things like coal in Victorian England, when you're reaching in slips of paper or spills to get a light to light your pipe or your cigar, when you're using the tongs to move the wood or the coal around, sparks tend to fly around, and some of those will land on your wood floor or your good rug. And so what you want to do is put down a hearth rug, something that's a little thicker and a little bit more durable that will protect the rest of your household from all of that potential um, combustion. Hmm. Very good. Yeah, and, you know, in the 17th and 18th uh, centuries, I think carpeting was becoming more common as the Industrial Revolution took place. And obviously... Uh, a carpet near the fireplace would need to be protected. Uh, people seeing holes in the in the carpet. Uh, I think it didn't come from pacing up and down in front of the fireplace, but more from the uh, the little embers that popped out. So uh, these uh, th these hearth rugs uh, have more in more modern times been constructed of fireproof material. And if you've ever had the chance to uh, touch a uh, a bear skin, or, you know, bear fur. Uh, it's very heavy. Uh, it, it, it's not a, a soft, fuzzy kind of thing. It's very heavy and uh, literally grizzly kind of hair, uh, as grizzly bear would imply. And it, it stands to reason that having a bear skin hearth rug would serve the purpose of that, um, not necessarily fireproof, but at least fire retardant uh, material that could withstand what comes off of the uh, the fireplace. Yes, yeah, exactly. And also, don't forget, it's, it's ornamental, too. I mean, the idea, mm. Victorians were all about incorporating elements and symbols of nature into their daily living areas. And so having a bearskin rug laid prominently before the hearth is, uh, you know, a kind of an ornament that would appeal to that sensibility. Yeah, and there, there was an interesting discussion over on the John H. Watson Society website uh, where they asked for speculation why a bearskin rug was chosen. And um, a couple of people that uh, have been regulars around these parts, uh, Sandy Cozen and James O'Leary, each had theories. Uh, Sandy said uh, this was... Uh, uh, a, a relic or could have been a relic of a hunting trip um you know may, maybe it was a thank you gift from leon sterndale um 
I'm not sure. Uh, Africa, obviously, is where you might find big game, the Black Forest. Uh, she said the resulting heads or skins were often considered decorative, especially in the billiards room or the entry hall of a large house. Of course, Watson and Holmes don't live in such a place, so the bearskin could have been a gift from a grateful client. Maybe before Watson's time, perhaps Mrs. Hudson picked it up secondhand as an appropriate furnishing for a bachelor establishment. <laughs> Yes, and James, you know, our friend James O'Leary wrote, you know, you have to remember that species, various species, were hunted to the verge of extinction. Polar bear skins were part of Doyle's own Arctic voyage. And you can see the great book that reprinted his illustrated diary of that trip called Dangerous Work. Um, James pointed out that, you know, in the industrial age and a growing middle class, people had more money to spend on luxury goods and the ability to get it from really anywhere on the globe, anywhere in the empire. And so animals were really sort of a commodity that could be harvested for profit. Um, the laws of supply and demand. Bear and tiger skin rugs were also a status good that signals one signaled one's place in the middle class and suggested one's prowess over nature, uh, even if the closest you ever got to wild beasts was the zoo. <laughs> That's great. Okay, and as we mentioned, this is where we do the drawing for our Trifles supporters. Thank you very much for being a member of our Trifles community. I should note on, excuse me, our Trifles Patreon community, I should note over on Patreon, uh, right now, if you do download the Patreon app, there is a chat function there, which we have uh, enacted, activated, whatever we have to do there. We asked a question. We, we asked you to give us some feedback about what you might like to hear in Season 8. Or you can email us. That works, too. But I should also note that Patreon tells us that a community uh, chat function on the web is also going to be available. So... If you are at your desktop and you go to patreon.com slash trifles, you will note in the weeks ahead that the community aspect of trifles will be lit up, and we look forward to putting that to more good use. So let's bring in the big prize wheel and give it a spin. All right, this is uh, every... Paid Patreon supporter. We're drawing a number at random, and it is number 44. And that looks like it is Julie Nicodemus. Congratulations, Julie. We will be sending you a back issue of the Baker Street Journal. If you'd like to be lucky like Julie, just go to trifles, uh, excuse me, patreon.com slash trifles or to the SherlockHolmesPodcast.com website. We look forward to welcoming you as a member of the community. Well, uh, very few mentions of the bear in the canon, and yet we have managed to stretch this episode into <laughs> about 25 minutes. Congratulations. You know, when, well I, think about, when I think about the length of this episode, <laughs> I really do think it's unbearable. Uh, but that is just a trifle. It is, of course, a trifle, but there is nothing so important as trifles. Please join us again next week for another installment of Trifles. Show notes are available on SherlockHolmesPodcast.com. Please subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts and be sure to check out our longer show, I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, where we interview notable Sherlockians and share news of the Sherlockian world. You've taken my breath away, Mr. Holmes. The game's up, Ryder. Bed up, man! Could you be in the fire? <laughs>